Okay, everyone. So uh, welcome uh, to ADOC's Ask the Experts fourth quarter webinar. Uh, my name is Ariella Shoham, even though it does say Tom Vallant, <laughs> who is the head of our business development. But uh, I'm Ariella Shoham. I'm ADOC's Vice President of Marketing, and I will be your host today. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, ADOC is the leading provider of AI solutions for radiologists. Our solutions help radiologists increase overall efficiency and improve patient care. We are FDA cleared, we're CE marked, and we're used in over 50 medical facilities worldwide. Our webinar today will address the AI beyond the hype. How can AI be actually implemented in practice? What are the complexities and the importance of workflow integration? and the need to take AI beyond the algorithm to provide value-based solutions. With me today, uh, I'm honored to have Dr. Paul Chang, Professor and Vice Chair of Radiology and Informatics at the University of Chicago School of Medicine, and our CEO, Elad Wallach. Before we begin, I just wanna draw your attention to the QA option on your control panel. All attendees are muted, but Please feel free to type in your questions at any time. Uh, since I'm here, I'll be moderating and I'll try and answer as these questions come up, but we will have an open QA session at the end. So without further ado, can I please forward the presentation rights to you, Dr. Chang. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank uh, ADOC for giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, spend some time ranting about the, the hype on deep learning and the machine intelligence in general in radiology. Uh, there's been so much hype now that we're now hyping the hype, uh, and I am guilty of that. I guess uh, the one good news is uh, I think we're beyond this comment the, you know, that radiologists are obsolete. There have been comments, as you know, from folks uh, typically outside our domain who may be experts in algorithm development and machine learning, but uh, don't know the complexities of what we do as, as radiologists and as physicians. So comments like this one where, you know, we're obsolete and they should stop training radiologists now, um, are probably uh, recognized now as, 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 as unrealistic and, and overstated. In fact, uh, Dr. Hinton himself has, re, uh, has, has mitigated and, and modulated his response to something that actually I think uh, still trying to get us a dig on us, but, but still is a little bit more realistic, and that is the role of radiologists will most certainly change, and hopefully for the better, as we learn to appropriately consume artificial intelligence so that we can go up the value chain and do far more cognitive and valuable uh, uh, things for our patients and referring colleagues. Um, I think the first thing to, to note is there's nothing new about this. Uh, radiology, we tend to buy very early into the hype of any sort of potentially disruptive technology, but it also takes much longer for us to actually consume the technology to the point that by the time we learn to appropriately consume it, uh, it's really only in retrospect that we recognize how transformative it has been, how it has changed and re-engineered ourselves as radiologists, and the comment almost always is less, oh my gosh, how transformative, but more, wow, it took about, it, 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 it's about time that we finally embrace something that my car and my refrigerator and my, my, my digital assistants have already done for years. That tends to be uh, the, the trend when it comes to consuming new technology. The Gartner hype curve, which is an example of, we ride this hype curve because again, we tend to, by early into any sort of hype, but it takes us a lot longer to appropriately consume. But whether or not you are advocates for artificial intelligence or still are skeptical, which is probably a, a, a good perspective to have, uh, we need some help. We're gonna need some help from advanced IT, including AI, uh, because right now, as I travel around the world, uh, my sense is many of us are barely hanging on using what we're doing now uh, because we're stuck between the rock and the hard place. We're expected to provide 
added value to our patients, but at the same time reduce costs. And this is a very difficult thing to do. And when you look at other industries, uh, without exception, they use uh, advanced IT, including uh, machine learning to try to achieve this. Uh, these, goal, these challenges in radiology are significant. It's not just that the size of data sets are increasing, uh, the complexity uh, of them uh, is as well. Uh, in addition, our, our clinical colleagues are demanding more than just morphologic description and interpretation of these studies. They are demanding increasingly more uh, actionable and precise phenotypic description, including quantitative, functional, and physiologic uh, interpretation. This move from qualitative to quantitative imaging is a huge challenge. I barely have time to measure uh, tumor measurements, and now you want us to do quantitative type approaches, physiologic data. This is very, very difficult for us to do the way we're doing it now. In other words, we're moving from a generic characterization to a much more actionable specific phenotypic characterization, the so-called radiomics uh, trend. Um, even though it's very, very early on, um, my sense is this is the, we've already taken uh, the leap here, and it's going to be more and more an expectation by our clinical colleagues that we provide this more specific um, phenotypic characterization. In addition, we need to understand that we have to go beyond what we've done now. In many ways, the old days before PACS, we were much more, more uh, relevant to patient care. We were the doctor's doctor. Uh, even though it was very inefficient, uh, physicians had to come to us in the reading room because that's where the actual films were. And they, we collaborated with each other uh, multiple times a day. Uh, today, with PACS and web clients, uh, our reports are the only way we tend to communicate with each other other than the inefficient phone call. Our reports are like messages in the bottle that we throw over the wall, hope that they get them, hope that they do the right thing. This isolated interpretation of radiologists not only kind of commoditizes radiology and isolates us, it's not ideal for patient care. And this trend or the desire to move from an isolated kind of interpretation model to a multidisciplinary synthesis and, and, and collaborative actionable management for patients is something that's very desirable uh, and again will require advanced IT. In addition to that, the thing that the C-suite is probably most important and most interested in is meaningful improvements in efficiency and, and reduced variability in quality. Advanced IT, as I said, will either help us or hurt us in, these, in addressing these challenges. The danger I see is complacency, the belief that uh, IT is solved, that our PACs, our EMR is pretty mature. Uh, I don't believe that. I have never heard any of my residents say, Dr. Chang, I wish uh, Twitter or Facebook or Yelp worked just like my PACs or EMR. I've never heard that. Uh, I've heard the opposite. Uh, I actually believe existing IT informatics offerings are still relatively immature compared to other business verticals. And unfortunately, this immaturity only allows us to demonstrate Kamai level service. We're gonna need, as I mentioned, advanced IT, uh, much more capable and agile IT to provide value in this much more complex environment. And as I said, if consumed properly, I think AI will help us. A uh, couple of misconceptions I think that adds to the hype. There's nothing new about AI, nor there's anything spooky. We've had AI in radiology for decades. Any of us who have used CAD for breast or lung nodules, that is a form of artificial intelligence. It's called machine learning. Uh, we've had artificial intelligence for decades. Uh, the thing that has made this more more uh, compelling lately is not so much the mathematics or the underlying computer science, but rather the fact that it can be real because of the fact that your kids want to kill aliens on their Xbox or PlayStation. Uh, I kid you not. It turns out that the mathematics about reconstructing video games is very, very similar to the same mathematics uh, required to do deep learning. And uh, it is the geographic processor unit that has enabled us to go from pure theory to actually uh, being at the cusp of actually making this real and useful for our clinical practice. Um, the other thing I, I always like to mention to folks when I try to introduce the concept of artificial intelligence is that the best way to view AI and, and machine learning and, and deep learning is that it is part of data science. And this is a 
fundamental uh, important concept. It's very, very similar to the cousin of big data in analytics, where the data drive the analysis rather than a preconceived information model or algorithm. It is the data. The data drive how uh, it's used and, 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 and the data give insight. And this is, sounds spooky, but in reality, it's very, very familiar. This is statistics. Uh, if I give you a lot of X, Y data points, you can apply statistics like linear regression, come up with some cost function or error reduction function, come up with a prediction, or what we might call hyperplane. In many, in, in, almost tongue in cheek, many of uh, data scientists who work in artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and deep learning will actually say, well, deep learning is essentially logistic regression on steroids. And in fact, if you look at this, this is actually the results of a deep learning training set on a, on trying to determine the difference between two flowers based on petal characteristics. And as you can see, this is essentially curve fitting. Um, the, the advantage of deep learning is it can do very powerful curve fitting without the requirement to have a preconceived idea. Uh, for instance, these uh, three populations would be very difficult to dis come up with a predictive model to distinguish amongst these three. You could, it would take years to come up with a complex preconceived uh, hypothesis, but with deep learning, if you have enough data, you can actually do this within minutes. And that is the power. Nothing spooky. It's just, like, it's a statistical method. It's a data-driven method to get insight and in modeling uh, if you have a lot of data. The real power of this uh, is with uh, the advantage of gra graphic processing units, you can now ch uh, chain and stack one regressor to regression process with another uh, uh, with the help of gra uh, GPUs and come up with very, very powerful results. And as many of you know, uh, this technology, this approach has been used from anywhere from classification, you know, is this a cancer, to segmentation, to improving and reducing noise and improving throughput in, a, in, in uh, uh, image acquisition to registration. These are very, very powerful use cases that, uh, that machine learning uh, uh, has great promise. But one of the major issues uh, is that there are a lot of challenges. These are early times. In the next few minutes, I try to like to, I'd like to convince you that, that these are early times and there are significant non-trivial challenges we're going to have to address before this becomes real. Hence the reason why many of us believe it's going to take a lot longer than many of us believe, uh, anticipate uh, to actually appropriately consume this technology. The first question is, how do we validate? How do we trust these systems? Unlike traditional machine learning approaches where you had a preconceived feature model, for instance, CAD, in breast, you had clever researchers and radiologists that came up with a preconceived uh, model or uh, hypothesis. I think cancers are ill-defined. They have microcalcifications. And then we built filters or convolutions to extract those features and then did the curve fitting to come up with a predictive model. What's nice about those and why machine learning years ago didn't freak everyone out and didn't cause a lot of hype is because we could make very transparent the underlying model. I think cancers are ill-defined. I think they look scary, whatever. You could share that model to other humans and other humans go, okay, that's reassuring. You're not doing something weird. Now, the power, but also the concern about deep learning. And that's the reason why I like the word deep, because deep not only means very capable, which these systems absolutely are, they're very, very capable, but deep is also apt because it also means obscure. It's a black box for most of us. It, we don't know uh, what the underlying model is because in general, deep learning systems don't have a preconceived model. That's its advantage. You don't have to be clever. You don't have to have uh, an underlying model. What you replace that cleverness is with lots and lots of vetted data. And just like a statistical regression, it will come up with the, the model on its own, but that requires a lot of data. We'll talk about that in a bit. But the underlying why it works will almost always be obscure. And that's problematic because uh, that means the validation is going to have to be statistically based. You're going to have to trust that ROC. So then that begs the question, how many training sessions are sufficient? How diverse should these training sets be? 
And one of the things I find surprising is that the early validation methodologies for these are very lightweight and suspect. And we'll talk about that in a bit, especially what I call the archive hype. The real question here when we talk about validation is, can we safely generalize the performance uh, of these systems to the general population? In other words, how do we avoid overfitting? Uh, to give you an example, one of the most powerful image uh, um, uh, machine learning, deep learning systems, ImageNet, uh, in the world, very, very powerful. It's one that has essentially sh shown the way in this technology, uh, thinks this picture of a turtle is a gun, thinks it's a rifle. Now, for most of you in the audience, you may not think it's a turtle, you may think it's a tortoise, you might think it's a reptile. My you know, six-year-old would know uh, that it's some sort of animal, no human, I think, would say, oh yeah, that's a rifle. And yet one of the most powerful and accurate image uh, AI classification systems thinks this is a rifle. This is an example of overfitting. This is problematic uh, to many of us and, and, and a little bit uh, disconcerting. In other words, what we're talking about in overfitting is here's, this is the same data set and two predictive regression models. If you look at this one, uh, the error in the prediction is zero. It's perfect fit. Uh, here, there's a lot of error in this, in this predictive hyperplane. The question I would ask you is, which one would you trust to generalize to other populations? And for most of us, intuitively, we would understand that this is probably more, more generalizable than this. And so the question is, if deep learning systems are obscure and it's difficult to understand what's going on, unlike the traditional machine learning approaches like CAD, how do we know that we can safely generalize if what you're doing is this? To make that example clear, let me describe an experiment that was done with one of our vendor partners to, to illustrate this, this problem. This, was use, this is a use case that is actually meaningless uh, in the real world. It was basically uh, training deep learning to see if you could predict what part of the anatomy a radiograph was. Like, could you predict this was a hand, a chest, or a clavicle? Um, now, obviously, we, there's no need for this. Obviously, we know what we're scanning. The reason we picked this is we could train it with thousands and thousands of cases because obviously every single radiograph has annotation. We know what it is. And we use uh, you know, uh, ImageNet and, it, and the performance, as you would expect, was almost perfect. It was fantastic, uh, wonderful, even though the use case doesn't make much sense. But here's the key. When you look at this wonderfully trained, high accuracy uh, system, it would think that this image is a mammogram, and this is a mammogram, and this is a mammogram, and this is a mammogram. Now, what's going on here? Actually, the system is actually being pretty clever. It's just being naive. Basically, what it learned was that mammograms, unlike other radiographs, the anatomy was on the side of the image. Because it's obvious, you know, our technologists strive to center the anatomy in every radiograph they take, Obviously, for mammography, that's not possible. And what the system was being trained in to identify mammogram, a mammogram was by saying, if the anatomy is on the side of the image, it's a mammogram. That's not wrong, but it's naive. You would never want a system to detect something using that kind of logic. So that's the point. This is statistical. This is curve fitting. There's, the, the artificial intelligence is not intelligent. There, it, it has no under, deep understanding of intent. It doesn't understand what's going on. It doesn't see the big picture. It just curve fits. And this actually is an example of overfitting uh, the, a, a characteristic for mammography that no human would use. So surprisingly, my, my criticism about these early days and why I think it's early is that early validation methodology is surprisingly lightweight and suspect. I don't want to go into this. This is a talk for more you know, data scientists, but there are a lot of ways that uh, it's, a, it's an advantage that we in healthcare are years behind other industries and, and other industries have come up with pretty good methods to validate machine learning, understanding that they can only use statistical validation because we cannot see uh, the underlying model. Uh, unfortunately, in radiology, we tend to use the wrong methodology approaches. I don't want to get great details, but the methodology we tend to use now are designed to work, and I don't want to make this a talk into statistical power, but basically, mathematically, the models that, you, that radiologists are using now, unfortunately, in, in our domain, 
actually require thousands of data set, the thousands of, of data points where we tend not to, we tend to have hundreds. And unfortunately, uh, that requires a different kind of validation that actually is quite expensive to do. Uh, so even though it's convincing, uh, you, you don't see that. It's very rarely seen in radiology. So again, our basic validation uh, methodologies are actually still in early days and, and, and quite not up to spec. Um, it's, it's not just the size of the training and, and, and test data sets that matters. The real question is, is this truly representative and generalizable to others in the real world? I mentioned this archive hype, and I don't want to get to spend a lot of time in this. Just to say, though, be very careful, especially when you read in the lay literature or Ant Mini or any of the kinds of, 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 of uh, uh, non-peer-reviewed journals, when you hear things like, oh, this algorithm works great and it's been published. Well, a lot of times people are being a bit disingenuous when they say been published because uh, a lot of these papers are published in something called archive. Now, there's nothing wrong with archive. Archive plays a very important role as for a form of collaboration and communication, but it's not peer reviewed. It's, an, it, 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 it's, it's a preprint archive. It's not, it, it's lightly moderated. Uh, it works best when everyone is equivalently expert. It's a form of collaboration, letters to the editor. It is not peer reviewed. And so when you read in the lay literature, a hype about, oh, this algorithm is fantastic and it's published. And when you look, it says archive, you basically need to understand that, nope, nope, nope. Uh, this is not peer reviewed and hasn't been validated accordingly. Now, in the remaining few minutes, let's talk about how do we prepare for this? Uh, in addition to the challenge of validating and trusting, avoiding overfitting, how can we consume this? And this is kind of my particular interest. The, 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 the uh, analogy I use is I, I actually believe a good machine learning algorithm, once we validate it, is like a wonderful race car. The problem is the fastest race car is just a hunk of metal if you don't have gas and roads. And in this context, in the world of machine learning, the gas is vetted data and the roads is workflow integration. And this requires a very capable IT infrastructure. And unfortunately, that's lacking for most of us. We need data interoperability. Most, I believe, a lot of AI applications now are kind of driven not by truly useful use case, but rather the data are available. You know, so they're nice to haves, right? Uh, not must haves. It's the reason why we have a thousand <laughs> bone age, it seems like bone age machine learning algorithms because the data are available. The question is, we, we won't be mature, we won't maturely use this technology unless, un, unless we move from nice to haves to must haves. The catch 22 is that I'm not gonna build the IT infrastructure to feed you data to train must have applications unless you have something that's worth me investing in that IT infrastructure, and that's a catch 22. How do we feed these at scales? How do we consume them? How do we integrate them in the workflow? Simply recapitulating the CAD model where we just throw a bunch of cues in DICOM is not going to work the way uh, we want it to. We need to have data and contextually driven human machine collaboration workflow orchestration, the yin to the EMRs yang. Um, the, the challenge is, unfortunately, when you look at IT architectures, the EMR is the, the 800 pound gorilla. It's, it, it's the thing that, that, that dominates most people's discussions when it comes to IT investment. The problem is that current in, in environment requires humans to be the integrating agent. I need a human to get information from pathology lab, my EMR. Whereas machine learning requires machines, algorithms to extract and use that. Our architectures are poorly designed to do this. We don't have the gas. We can't provide gas and we can't provide the roads to do this. When you look at other industries, they have used a different kind of approach. This is one example, service art architecture. It's what we have at the University of Chicago that allows us to drill for gas, to provide the gas for uh, AI, to provide workflow orchestration. I don't want to go into great detail here. I don't have enough time, but this is our formal architecture for at the University of Chicago. But the key point here, it was designed to uh, support not only uh, uh, machine learning, but also big data and analytics. And so that's one advantage and one hedge strategy. Uh, prepare your existing IT infrastructure to be able to feed and consume future 
uh, agents, including AI, you want to hitch your wagon, hitch your wagon to analytics because it may be difficult to, tr to convince your IT folks to invest for deep learning because we have no killer must have apps just yet. Uh, however, uh, big data and analytics is something that many people in the C-suite are interested in. And that also requires a similar kind of interoperability. So to me, that's one huge strategy, a hedge strategy one can do now. Uh, when it comes to building roads and workflow orchestration, um, Elad's going to go into greater detail with that. Uh, but one of the issues here is I think some of the most of the applications here, again, as I said, nice to haves and must haves, and the emphasis is on imaging. There, uh, and, and I actually believe that the real benefit in the, uh, of these technologies is not just extracting information from images, but extracting information from unstructured narratives. So these systems need to be poly capable. And as I said, recapitulating the CAD model is limiting. Um, I put this not to, to denigrate quality, but a lot of the use cases people describe, like, oh, detecting, reducing error, and detecting nodules, these, at least now, are nice to have. So I know that sounds horrible, but when it comes to the C-suite, quality is a given. Quality is a floor mat. You don't buy a car for the floor mat. It's expected to be for free. The car is efficiency and productivity. So the goal is to pick use cases in machine uh, learning that improves efficiency, but you also will improve quality because efficiency and quality loathe the same enemy and that's variability. So when I say quality is a floor mat, uh, I don't mean it as an insult. I'm telling you this is a strategy. Uh, don't lead with quality. The use cases, I believe the early must have use cases have to improve return on investment, total cost of ownership, or regulatory requirements. In other words, the early must have use cases of machine learning have to address improved efficiency and productivity. Uh, and I think that's the mistake a lot of people are making when it comes to the algorithms that I see. They want to leap to these very difficult use cases, you know, diagnosis, replacing the radiologist, all this, where I think the real sweet spot is what other industries have discovered. Most other industries that have done this for years use deep learning not to replace their knowledge workers, but rather enhance them by reducing the busy work, by reducing the inefficiency, the variability, uh, what I call workflow optimization. I think my prediction is you're going to see the early wins, the must have uh, must case, uh, the must have use cases in artificial intelligence will address these minimally heuristic workflow optimizations that reduce the busy work. Uh, in other words, we're talking about data and contextually driven human machine collaborative workflow orchestration. I only have a couple of minutes, so I don't want to go into this. This is the platform that we're building at University of Chicago to do this. Let me just give you a couple of examples of stuff we've done in Chicago that show how humans and machines using uh, machine learning can help uh, uh, the radiologists avoid the busy work. One of the things we described and actually published a couple years ago was an unintended negative consequence of CPOE and order entry was people weren't telling us anything. 60% uh, of the time, they're not telling us they have Crohn's disease. 8% of the time, they don't have, they don't tell us we have cancer. The patient has cancer. You know, uh, I, we are imperfect observers, therefore Bayes' theorem applies. I need clinical context. Uh, so for years, for about 12 years, we've had this system because of our soil infrastructure at University of Chicago, where we can extract real-time information from the EM and other sources, real-time lab, real-time reports, problem lists. The pro and so we've had this for 10 years. The problem is it still requires the radiologist to spend time reading all this. And, and there's a lot of, that introduces variability. So yes, this saves me a few minutes. I don't have to call, I don't have to go to the EMR, but I still have to read. Well, this is a great example of using machine learning and NLP uh, to automatically read this for me. So for instance, the system can say, look, I've re read these things, this patient has lung cancer. Uh, oh, by the way, I detect the, the patient has an abnormal white count and a lactic acidosis. And two CTs ago, someone said, you better pay special attention to the segment two liver lesion. This is an example. I, I don't feel threatened by this. I don't think this is going to replace me. This allows me to save time and reduce busy work. Same thing here. This is something we published a couple years ago as well, showing uh, measurement of lesions. M machine learning can help uh, minimize the hassle, finding what the prior lesions are, predicting where the new lesions are, automatically putting it in reports. We published this a few years ago, shows it actually saves time, about 30% of time in interpreting uh, oncology 
uh, images. Here's another example uh, in MR. MR is very complex to read. First, we have to identify it, like in this case in the flare, but then we have to play where's Waldo. We have to find it in every other pole sequence. Well, machine learning can do this quite efficiently and actually do the subtractions, determine whether or not there's uh, enhancement or whatever. This helps save me time. Here's another example for incidental nodules that we've been working on. Whereas I, if machine learning or a human like me detects the nodule, machine learning can automatically check to see if there's a smoking history, check the latest recommendations, put it into a database. So as to avoid uh, minimizing the hassle or the busy work I as a human radiologist. So we're talking about using machine learning and the humans collaboratively together like other industries. And that's essentially what we've learned. This is a very nice article from the Wall Street Journal that I, I uh, recommend to folks. It basically says the best use of AI requires humans working together. So it's really not a threat to us. It will help us avoid the busy work. So in summary, you know, is deep learning a threat to the clinician? My feeling is no, uh, we've gone through this many times. It's gonna take us a lot longer. We've always re-engineered and redefined our roles, going up the value chain to provide better value to our patients and referring physicians by incorporating potentially disruptive technology. Uh, the problem is we're late adopters. It's gonna take us a lot longer to do this. Deep learning is neither the horrible threat or promise savior. I am optimistic that it will be appropriately consumed by us, but there's some work that we need to do. And those suggestions, I think, uh, it might be early to pick a winner, uh, too early to pick a winner right now, although that's changing. Um, a reasonable head strategy, prepare your IT infrastructure, drill for gas, build your roads, uh, hitch your wagon to analytics to get that prioritized. Uh, you want to have must-have use cases. Look for things that actually the C-suite will be willing to pay for, and that is, things that improve efficiency, productivity, uh, strive for deep integration with the workflow. Uh, the goal, as I said, is data-driven, optimized human machine workflow orchestration. Uh, and you wanna stay engaged. You wanna avoid the hype, but uh, understand that we're gonna need some help to improve the value we provide to our physicians, uh, referring physicians and patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang. Um... I'm going to hand over to Alad and then we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. That was very, very interesting. Yes, thank you, Ariella. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Chang. I always enjoy Ojun listening to your presentation as I think they really cut through all the, all the hype to what's tr what really is important. And I must say I'm really happy uh, for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. And the reason why I'm so happy is that there is this sense that we're on the verge of a new generation in, in radiology AI. And when I say a new generation, I don't mean necessarily we're on a new generation of, of new technologies uh, that can aggregate additional information, but actually on the verge of creating the data finally and the outcomes and the robust evidence that proved that AI really has significant impact on, on the day-to-day -day radiology workflow. And the purpose of my short presentation to you today is actually my view that us as vendors, and I think the whole AI ecosystem, should move from talking about algorithms and capabilities and models, I really hate the word models, uh, to a world where we talk about value in the clinical outcomes and solutions that provide actual uh, clinical care. And obviously, I, I'll talk a bit about our journey in ADOC as a use case about how we moved from a capability to a solution that can actually uh, improve patient outcomes. And just as some background, I think all of you here today, as you're probably very interested in our in, involved in the space, uh, we all understand that radiology is really in the forefront of all of this. And basically radiology, as, as we see it, is the most data-driven medical specialty, and therefore the first one to suffer from the overload of data, but actually also the first one that can benefit from the huge utilization of data and from the insights of artificial intelligence. And us, as an AI ecosystem actually made a mistake in the last couple of years. And we promised this grand vision about 
what AI can achieve and what benefits can, can come out of AI. However, we didn't uh, take the time to walk the clinical community through it. And, look, and we always talked about algorithms and capabilities, but it didn't talk about the way from algorithms to how we can get those tremendous benefits for clinical care. And for me, the key is to talking about solutions and not just algorithms. And the way I look at this, it's basically uh, a journey of, uh, of, a, of an AI solution from an algorithm to a mature solution. So it begins from an algorithm, from developing a model that can detect certain things uh, or segment certain things. And that model you measure by the traditional accuracy, sensitivity and specificity. You then move to talk about uh, about products. And when I, when I say product, I mean to talk about workflow integration of the same algorithm, and that would be measured by engagement or how would physician use the product in a daily setting. And then we come to the most mature aspect, which is a solution. And for me, when I say solution, I mean it targets a specific clinical pain and provides uh, strong clinical impact and improving clinical care for patients. So now I'd like to dive a bit deeper into the way we did the same journey in, in ADOC from an algorithm to a clinical solution. So the first thing we did was actually uh, focus on the capability. And what we got really good at is taking a clinical problem, something we want to detect, and developing an algorithm that detects it. So for example, if you would tell me, I want to detect uh, air in the abdomen, a few months later, I could give you an algorithm with 95 plus sensitivity that can detect air in the abdomen. And to show you some example of that capability, uh, it, we got pretty good in the sense that we, get, we could detect pretty subtle things. So this is an example of a subdural hemorrhage that we could detect. Here we can see an example of the, uh, before mentioned, the free air in the abdomen. So pretty subtle findings. Here we can see an example of a cervical spine fracture that has been detected by the same solution and the same technology. And here we can actually see uh, a PE example as well. And obviously, as I mentioned, uh, the validation is critical. And when we took those different algorithms, we then had to go over large amounts of data to validate and see if those algorithms actually work. And this is just an example of our intracranial hemorrhage algorithm. And this was validated on a roughly 600 studies. And we reached pretty high accuracies, both on the sensitivity and as important on the specificity, which means we don't flag a lot of false positives. And this was done actually on a prospective, prospective case that in a, a US academic hospital. But for me talking about this kind of validation, that is actually just the first step. It's important, don't get me wrong. It's important to have clear metrics for the accuracy of the solution, but that's just the basics. After you get this algorithm, validated algorithm, you have to go to the next step, which is developing a product. And once again, for me, a product is creating a workflow integration that can provide value. So for us, the way we integrated, we created a triage solution. So that capability to detect, let's say, uh, intracranial hemorrhages was then integrated into the radiology workflow and work list. So our artificial intelligence takes an exam right after the patient left the scanner. We analyze it by using our AI server, and then we flag patients that we have detected acute findings with. So for example, if patient number, uh, 
uh, number 20 down the list had intracranial hemorrhage, we could flag him to the top and thus reduce the turnaround time for that patient and thus increase overall system efficiency and reduce variability, as Dr. Cheng mentioned. And we saw that this actually is something that physicians can use. And in quite a short time, we've been able to show that this solution is used almost on a daily basis by our users. And in under a year, we achieved product, a sustainable product engagement of more than 96%, which means 96% of the exams that we help flag um, have been assisted by our system. And we believe that's only because the way we integrate it into workflow, which is both seamless and very intuitive for the users to use. They don't need to click anything. It always runs in the background. And it's very simple to use. So we took this capability to detect uh, acute findings and we wrapped it up with a product and we validated that this product is at, least, uh, is at least engaged by users by measuring how much time they spend by using our solution. But even that, is not enough. And that is only an interim step. Because what you really care about is the outcomes that such a product can provide. And if I can share some of my, my, our experience, frankly, when we provided the solution to, to our users, we initially expected for them to look at our solution, our product and drive the outcomes that they can achieve from it. But then I understood that for us as AI providers, we actually have to be able to provide the clear picture, the full picture, and analyze exactly what kind of outcomes our solution can help provide. And do the gap analysis of where are the pain points that this kind of product can help improve. And I wanna give you just two examples right now of preliminary research we did about the capability of such a product to actually improve outcome and, uh, outcomes and efficiencies uh, of a department. So this first outcome is related to outpatients. And let me tell you uh, uh, a typical scenario of, of an outpatient to show you the potential benefit. So as, as you know, outpatients sometimes can get pretty, uh, pretty late in the day. And in some institutions, outpatients that arrive after a certain hour uh, are discharged and are only interpreted the day after if they're not stat outpatients. So if there was a patient with, let's say a subdural hemorrhage, a surprise subdural hemorrhage, that patient would have gone home and waited for more than 12 hours, sometimes 18 to 24 hours, to be interpreted. And by the way, this is not a theoretical case. This is actually a true case from one of our US customers. Uh, fortunately, uh, they had our prioritization product installed and we helped flag that patient in the work list. So a few minutes later, they saw that there is a patient with a suspect bleed. They open up in the packs, in their own packs, and they saw that that patient had subdural hemorrhage and the patient was contacted for treatment on the spot without leaving the institution. And obviously, if I wanna be, I wanna be skeptical of this. I wanna actually, I am probably uh, the one who's doing the most, uh, being the most devil's advocate for our solution and saying, okay, but how often does this really happen, right? How often do we get outpatients with acute finding? So we actually tested it just because it's so important. And we saw that in one institution, for example, we looked at all of these outpatient population, we ran all of the algorithms we mentioned above, and we saw that 2.7, almost 3% of outpatients have acute pathologies that have been identified by our AI solution. And if I'm looking at data before and after the deployment of our solution, 
we saw that roughly half of them, 1.3% of outpatients with acute findings had turnaround times of more than four hours. Some of them were those patients that waited for the whole night. And after ADOC, we were able to reduce that time or did reduce that outlay percentage significantly and make sure that patients that do have acute findings could be treated on time. So once again, I wanna, I wanna clarify, obviously not all patients with the acute findings we've detected before are necessarily in a critical situation, right? They are outpatients in, you know, they're walking, they're talking. However, in some of those acute patients, and I'm talking here on a significant amount, some of them you would have wanna treat on, on a more timely manner. And if we're looking about those 2.7%, those are 23 patients uh, per month in that institution. So 23 patients per month that are outpatients with acute findings in that institution. Looking at actually another type of value is in the emergency department. And one kind of misleading statistic is the average ED turnaround time. And this study was performed, and once again, these are just preliminary results, but this study was performed in a leading institution in the US, which had quite an incredible emergency department turnaround time uh, for cases, 38 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, those 38 minutes don't really show the whole picture because you don't care about all those patients that were interpreted in 10 or 20 or 30 minutes. You care about those small percentage of outliers that sometimes take a significant amount of time. And when we actually looked at the data, and this was quite a significant amount, this was based on six months of data, we saw that roughly 4% of patients in the emergency departments with head CTs that had intracranial hemorrhages had turnaround time larger than two and a half hours. That means once again, at 4% of all patients with uh, ICHs have turnaround times greater than two and a half hours. So once again, not all of them had severe outcomes out of it, but I would believe that most, uh, most emergency departments, just due to risk analysis, would have wanted to treat those patients in a more timely manner. And after the deployment of the solution, we were able to reduce that amount significantly. So once again, a clear outcome would be the ability to remove those outliers, to make sure, even if you don't change uh, the outcome for those patients that you reduce from 30 minutes to 20 minutes, but to make sure that you don't have those outliers with two, two and a half, or even sometimes three hours that require care. And if I'm summing up, so obviously I just presented two preliminary research studies we've done on the outcomes of the solution. But this is actually what excites me about AI. I think moving from talking about models and algorithms to talking about real scenarios, products, and outcomes is the key to the success of the AI field and getting beyond the hype. So we were talking about all those grand vision, all those awesome benefits of potentially AI, but we're, we're not uh, matching those with clear solutions. And nowadays we're starting to see more and more products and hopefully more and more solutions that focus on specific outcomes that can be improved with artificial intelligence. And uh, what we're doing right now is just the tip of the iceberg of what can be done with artificial intelligence. Uh, but I believe in the near future, we'll see uh, more and more of this. And you as radiologists should expect this from us as AI vendors and also from the whole ecosystem uh, as well. Uh, so with this in mind, I'll stop sharing and uh, hand it over back, back to me. To you, thank Ariella. you, Alad. <laughs> so thank you both, Alad and Dr. Chang. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, we're at the 50 minute mark and uh, that leaves us exactly with uh, 10 minutes to spare if there are any questions. So uh, if anyone would like to submit some questions, uh, there is a QA um tab uh, on your control panel uh so i will be taking uh
questions and reading them out to uh, each one of the presenters and they'll be able to answer. So um, as, you, as you start, I see hands coming up and uh, some questions being typed. So let me just uh, uh, send a question to you, uh, Dr. Chang. Um, I have a question about the specific criteria that a, de a department should look for when determining an AI infrastructure that can be relevant for AI um, and relevant to, for AI and integrating with it in the future. Can you give any specific examples? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's worth two hour talk. In fact, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll promote my own. Uh, so at this year's RSNA, there are two courses, uh, if you just search on my name, uh, that I give to specifically address this, and that is how to prepare your radiology department and uh, IT department uh, for big data and AI. Uh, so, um, uh, so that's one, I, because it takes a long time. But just general highlights about this. I think the first realization is understanding that, and full disclosure, when I'm not seeing patients, I am part of IT. So I speak as an IT person now. Uh, the first uh, observation I make is the, the challenges that I see have very little to do with technical capability or believe it or not, resource limitation. Uh, and that tends to surprise a lot of folks. Uh, a lot of folks, especially in radiology, will go, you know, IT people are lazy, they're stupid, they don't listen to me. Uh, we may not listen to you, but we're not lazy and we're not stupid. We're actually quite rational. And you have to understand before, during fee for service, where most of our IT um, uh, shops were built, uh, it would be irrational to spend a single dime to differentiate our IT architecture or staff to be better than anybody else's because in a fee-for-service environment, that didn't make any sense. It, it makes more money to invest on marketing or buying a new CT scanner. It's only recently as we move to more shared risk uh, contracts that IT has to be different, has to give us a differential advantage. Um, so to me, the real challenge is not picking a particular architecture like the question says, you know, what particular, I mean, there are a whole bunch of ones and I'll go into in a bit some options, but the general challenge is cultural. Uh, it, it, it's cultural, it, it's a lack of governance, it's a lack of true collaboration between users and IT. And so the first recommendation I have is before you start picking a particular architecture uh, to, 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 to drill for gas or build roads, it's first we need to repair and create a truly collaborative culture between IT and the clinicians. And this is hard to do. And, and, and the blame is on both sides. And I have a whole talk on that as well. But, but that's point number one. Point number one, before you start talking about what particular widgets or architecture you, you establish to support AI or big data, uh, you have to have a true governance and, and, and cultural model that actually is strategic and, 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 and will work together. That being said, we have to get away from this EMR centric perspective. Now, EMR is a wonderful transaction processing system. It is designed to address the workflow, uh, but ill suited to support big data analytics and, and machine learning. And so one of the huge advantages without picking favorites um, uh, is uh, I'm a big believer of intellectual arbitrage. We are 10, 15 years behind other industries when it comes to interoperability. It's the reason why other vertic business verticals have been able to adopt AI so much smoother than we have uh, because they are IT infrastructure. They have the gas, they have the roads. Uh, so to me, before I, instead of picking favorites, I mean, I have a favorite, I'm a big believer of service oriented architecture, but whether or not you pick that or microtransactions or APIs or edge apply, uh, you know, state aggregators, there's a whole different ways of doing this um, depending on your local capability or your, uh, uh, or, or your budget, uh, look to other industries. That's what we did. We, we, before we did anything, we looked at other industries. We looked at what, uh, we're in Chicago, so we looked at insurance companies, Boeing, uh, you know, uh, large companies, and say, how did you do this? And, and, and what we saw were common themes. Uh, it's the reason why we picked service-oriented architecture, but today there are a lot of other options. There, there's microtransactions, there are API moves, uh, uh, API type strategies, there are, as I said, state aggregator approaches. The details are less important than changing the government's under, governance and understanding why you want to do this. 
I, I, I would finish the rant with two other comments. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to commit and, and convince the C-suite to invest and create this collaborative governance change and cultural change with IT by pitching AI alone, because we're still early times in that. To me, hitch your wagon to analytics, because C-suite is demanding the big data stuff, right? The analytics, the complex event processing, uh, that kind of stuff. Well, it turns out, because as I mentioned in my talk, uh, artificial intelligence is the is within data science. Uh, what's good for analytics is good for AI. And so hitch your wagon to analytics. That's a good strategy to get engaged by IT and the C-suite to, to, to loosen up the resources. And the final thing I would say is we have to get beyond the cookie cutter commodity view of IT. Every other business vertical bends over backwards, making sure they use IT solutions that give them an unfair advantage from their competitor. Um, we are crazy. We basically, I can go anywhere in the, in the world and, and your EMR uh, implementation will be almost identical to mine. Your packs will be the same as, as mine. No other business does that. No other business does that. The problem is we, if you're going to use cookie cutter commodity level applications, which is what we do in healthcare, then you're cookie cutter. It's going to be very difficult for you to leverage IT, either analytics or AI, to differentiate yourself. And now we have to. Before we didn't have to. In fee-for-service, everyone won. Uh, now we're going to have to compete. And so we have to move uh, beyond this idea of just consuming applications from vendors. Now, what I'm, off, what, what I'm saying is when I look at other industries, I see another common thread, and that is the development of what we call DevOps. It's one of the first things I did when I was in Chicago. It's what I did when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, and that is you want to have people that can locally optimize your vendor offerings. There's always this little last mile uh, integration capability that the vendors aren't willing to provide because there's no money to be made in that. This localization is, is what other industries have used DevOps for. DevOps actually saves us money. It, 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 it's not extra FTE. In fact, almost every hospital I visited has some form of DevOps. They just don't realize they're doing local uh, development. And so that'd be the final thing I would say. I mean, start with cultural change, change your governance model, understand that we cannot be cookie cutter. You want to use IT strategically to give you an unfair advantage. And that's going to require some form of localization, optimization with DevOps. Thank you, Dr. Chang. And I'm so happy you have a presentation about this as well at RSNA. So it's a good uh, reminder for the attendees to, to, to visit you at RSNA, obviously visit us at RSNA as well. Okay, we actually, I have, there are great questions that are coming up. I'm going to just send one to Elad because I don't want to keep this longer than an hour. I want to appreciate everyone's time. And I do want to tell you that um, I will be addressing all these uh, questions and we will be communicating answers privately to everyone who's actually asked a question. So the last question will go to Elad. Um, there's a question about um, commercial applications, right? Like ours and how do we scale across institutions, right? Every institution has many different protocols for performing ver various studies. So how do you, how, what can you share about how a commercial solution can be applicable across various institutions? Um, yeah, that's, that's truly a great question about the generalizability of, uh, of AI. Actually, uh, Dr. Chang and myself, had, uh, just recently a discussion about it. Um, and I would say that for an AI vendor, the generalizability is crucial because you wanna make sure that uh, your algorithm works across, across institution and you have to monitor that very closely. Uh, one of the exciting things that are happening is actually more and more, let's call them honest brokers taking a position to help us do this validation. So at the moment, uh, we're actually going to start, I would say, stay tuned for, for RSNA, but I would say we are going to release uh, a solution that would enable us together with a collaborator to do an objective assessment of AI um, across institutions and in the same institution across different scanners. And this would allow it to get visibility into how AI works um, within your institution and across different, uh, across different scanners. And I think I would just say it like this. First of all, it's critical, critical 
to develop an AI algorithm with a very highly robust and varied data set. Uh, just as I would say, for example, we developed ours uh, with data from more than uh, 17 institutions, uh, dozens of scanners uh, to help us really, really develop our best solution. And second, we're actually doing uh, a test in every medical center we deploy to make sure that the data is still valid. Uh, so far, we found that it still, it still is quite robust, but it is something that is, is required. And hopefully, in the near future, we'll have solutions that are even, even more scalable than that. Thank you so much, Alad, and thank you for, uh, wow, exactly on the hour. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Chang for joining us. It was a, it was a pleasure, and thank you, Alad, for, for your session. I thought both were extremely insightful. Um, this session is recorded. We're going to share the recording with everyone um, who has registered and, of course, who has attended, uh, as well as address the questions that came up and that, unfortunately, we weren't able to answer. So I will bid you all farewell. Thank you both again, uh, Dr. Chang and Alan, and I wish you all a good uh, day, good evening, wherever you are listening to us. Thank you very much.